So we're able to understand um, the crust of the issue when it comes to memory, meaning that um, we're exposed to the fact that when it comes to memory, it's in stages. So we have um, the sensory memory, um, short-term memory, and what, and long-term memory. And afterwards, we're able to what, know the various mechanisms that goes through for information to move from sensory memory to short-term memory and long-term. Also, um, I, we also delve into the various models. We have several models of it, but I expose you to two of them, which is um, Badley and Hitch model and um, that's Atkinson and Schifrin's model. So today, we, we want to also find out what are some of the means or mechanisms in which sometimes people usually forget um, this information. You know, we said, oh, when it comes to their long-term memory, that also, that's why I chose my words very carefully when talking about the long-term memory. If you are paying attention, I kept on emphasizing that, oh, the long-term memory is relatively permanent. I didn't say, oh, the short-term memory is permanent. When I say the short-term memory is relatively permanent, it means when information gets to the long-term memory, um, you, are you are likely not to, not to lose the information. It sticks. So one might ask, oh, so if information sticks permanently when it is stored at the long-term memory, where, then why is it that some individuals, after they've stored information for a longer period and it became easy for them to recall, then by one or two reasons, they just forget. Why? Why does these things really happen? If you are saying when information gets to the long-term memory, it becomes permanent or relatively permanent. So that's where the relative comes in. It means that although the long-term memory, when information gets there, it is permanent, by one or two reasons, sometimes due to certain accidents, for instance, that someone might be exposed to, could what could, um, maybe leaching or damage some of the tissues in the brain, leading to memory impairment. So yes, definitely. So long as someone experienced an accident, then the person is likely to, to lose certain information, especially if the accident led to some damages in the brain structures responsible for memory. And currently, you know the specific brain structure responsible for memory, which is the hippocampus. So definitely, one of the key things in which, which could lead to accident is, for instance, traumatic brain injury, which is when someone gets an accident whereby uh, some of the tissues in the brain gets da damaged, like normal accident, car accident, or vehicle accident, then it have, um, maybe some portions of the brain get damaged, especially the hippocampus. Then definitely, the person could what? Could um, forget some of these things. Apart from that, certain conditions could also affect um, memory. And I think you know most of these things, like um, the stroke that you know of, the stroke that you are exposed to. So it means that when someone experiences stroke, and if, let's say, the stroke to a large extent affect, um, affected certain brain areas responsible for memory, if, if, if it affected especially the temporal loop, because the hippocampus can be found at the temporal loop. So when the stroke to a large extent um, affects the temporal loop, then the person might, or the person is likely to, uh, to forget one or two things. So the person um, forgetting certain information or losing memory is what is normally referred to as amnesia. Amnesia is basically known as um, loss of memory loss of what of memory due to some of these things. Okay, so depending on um, the accident, 
the amnesia could what could be very very low when i say very low it means the memory loss of the of that individual could what could be minimal or just mild other people to their amnesia is really profound it means it's really really severe because of maybe how these accidents um, led to lesions or distractions or damages in the brain yeah So, in terms of um, amnesia, for instance, we have two main types, two main types of amnesia. So we have um, retrograde amnesia and anterograde amnesia. We have retrograde amnesia and anterograde amnesia. So we normally say um, retrograde amnesia um, usually happens um or people lose is when um people lose memory before um a specified time or event after the brain injury so after the person what had these brain injuries due to stroke or accident some people they have difficulties recalling um previous memories that they've stored past memories that they've stored they have difficulties recalling them when it happens then we call it um retrograde amnesia so for instance let's say kwame has stored memories of maybe um the first face-to-face -face lecture he had at G gcuc kwame used to recall everything the incident that transpired and so on and, and what have you. Then um, just yesterday, Kwame had an accident affecting his brain, leading to the amnesia. Okay, so the Kwame is in the hospital. Um, surgeons have done certain stitches and everything, which uh, we are trying to find out whether Kwame has lost any memory. Then you ask Kwame, oh, so do you recollect the first lecture that you had or the first face-to-face -face lecture that you had at GCUC? At first, this should have been something easier that Kwame should, or should recall. Then you will see Kwame what, straining Trying to, uh, trying to recollect those information. Because at first, he used to, it was, it came to him at ease when recollecting. But you could see Kwame is really, really what, straining hard just to recollect, but nothing keeps on coming. Everything is blank. At that point in time, then we are seeing the kind of memory loss Kwame is experiencing is referred to as retrograde amnesia. Then we have um, the other type. We have the other type known as anterograde amnesia. Then with this, um, there's loss of memory after a specified time or event. So it means after the accident, after the person has experienced maybe the brain injury due to stroke or um, the TBI, the person would have difficulties forming new memories then and day out the person will have difficulties forming new memories so it means um the person could recollect past information all right but whenever um he's trying to learn something new even after the accident let's say um doctors came to his end his eyes were, were opened, he was conscious and all that, had this discussions with him concerning his condition or even casual, what, um, casual conversations with him. Within some few minutes, when you ask Kwame, oh, the doctors who came around, did you see, did you see them? 
what kind of discussions were they having? What was this doc doctor's name? Kwame wouldn't be able to what, recollect. He might perceive these doctors as what? As individuals he has never seen them before. Why? Because due to the anterograde amnesia, Kwame has difficulties forming what? New memories. But past memories or memories before the accident are intact. Memories he has already, he, he has already stored before the accident or the stroke are intact. But the key thing is when it comes to him, he has difficulties forming new what fresh memories altogether. So that's the distinction um, between retrograde and um, anterograde amnesia. Okay, so let's use this um, example for you to for you to get it well. So, uh, okay, Christiana, um, please your hand is up. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, please, I wanted to inquire. Can okay. there be a situation where um, the client may experience both the retrograde and the anterograde at the same time? It's highly possible, and I'll, and I'll come to that. I'll give you a case study whereby that person experienced the same thing. So good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Madam Comfort, Jima. Sir, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Sir, please, so in the ritual grid, you mm -hmm. only mentioned the person not being able to recollect previous memories. Yeah. So, so I'm asking, can a person also... <clears throat> Would that, can the person also form new ones in the retrograde? Yes. So with the retrograde, if um, the there's no anterograde amnesia, the person wouldn't be able to recollect um, memories he or she stored before the accident. But in terms of forming new memories, yes, the person can what can um, recollect. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. So if there's no anterograde amnesia, then definitely the person could what form new memories. But the key thing is that the person would have difficulties forming past memories before or memories he had already stored before the accident. He wouldn't be able to what recollect. Okay. Then I think the last person, then I'll continue. Anne, Anne Gab, Gabra. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. The retrograde, can we uh, link it to in cases of eclampsia where they lose their consciousness when they ask them, where are you? They can't be able to um, answer that. Can we, in, in, in linking it to our middle field practice, can we mm -hmm. use that as an example? With with um, losing consciousness, you know, for instance, I think this normally happens during a time of labor, right? And uh, when they go into their their eclampsia fit, and then they come back, you ask them, "Mama, if a hospital now, he can't mention within the thing, he can't mention." But later, and you see that they come back to themselves. Yeah. So let's find out when it comes to this. Is it that um? They lose conscious consciousness during that period with it. Yes, during the period. Yes. Yeah. So, uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Then fine. It could be more or less like related to what to the retrograde. If in case you ask them past issues, you are having difficulties doing, then it means that they are in that sort of what retrograde um, amnesia in that regard. Okay, sir. Thank yeah. you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay, so let's use this example. If someone bumps their head, their hairs, blackout, then comes around, but cannot remember their name or where they live, they may have retrograde amnesia. Why? Because you've already stored you, your name, which is a, a past thing, or where you live. You've already, it is a previous memory that you've stored. So after a blackout, when you say blackout, like if the person faints for one or two reasons, since maybe the person hit his head on an object or a wall, 
or there was a collision, then all of a sudden the person fainted. Then after the person comes back to consciousness, you ask the person, oh, what's your name? Please, what's with your name? The person can't even want to recollect. Um, where are you at the moment or where do you live? The person can't really recall. Then it means it is retrograde amnesia. But if the same incident happens, the person bumps his, he his head off and experiences blackouts, then afterwards comes out of the blackouts, then the person will have troubles remembering new, new information like today's date, what's today's date? The person will have difficulties remembering. Or this early morning, let's say it happened, the, the blackouts happened around, say, um, around 10 a.m. And you ask the person, oh, this morning around, say, 7 or 8 a.m., what food were, did, did you eat? The person has difficulties even what remembering that. Then it means that these are current what these are current information we expect the person to what to recall. So if the person is having difficulties recollecting them, then it means it is a typical anterograde amnesia. Hence, you have difficulties forming new memories. All right, Madam Christiana. Sir, okay. please, for, for what you are saying, uh, is it possible that um, the retrograde and the anterograde, they are time bounded? Because we have this orientation. When the other lady was talking about uh, after yeah. having the eclamptic fit, yeah, after having the eclamptic fit, they are disoriented. That one is short lived, it's just for a brief moment. It okay, so it's more it's like, um, they are oriented to time, place, and person. Yes, that, for oh, the okay. short time, they are disoriented. They don't oh, okay. know where they are time. That one can re-term it as the retrograde. Yeah? No, okay. if it, is, it has way. to do with, if it has to do with um, within a short, a brief period in terms of um, orientation to time, place, and person, and all that for a, a brief period, to some extent, look, with retrograde, um, it goes beyond a brief duration in that then regard. It's, it's more or less like it is time bounded, like it is time bounded. In, in most situations, when it comes to amnesia, yes, it's time okay. bounded. Yeah. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, so let me let me continue on. So I remember someone asked. Can some can um, a person experience both retrograde and anterograde amnesia? Yes, you can. A typical example is this man, known as um, Henry Molassen. Henry Molassen. Um, in most neurological books, you would see his name abbreviated as HM. You can even Google it and just type HM study. Um, we never knew that his name was Henry Molassen until, until if I remember, I think 2018 or so. Then we got to know that his name is um, Henry Molassen. Sorry, it's rather um, 2008, not 18. Yeah, so until 2008, then we got to know that, oh, the HM, HM that we know of is this man, Henry Molassen. So um, there's a reason as to why in most situations, um, people's identities are abbreviated, especially when doing research on them. And I believe you've done research, right? You are in love with Fernandez and I believe you've done research or I, I did lie. No, we are doing that. You are doing that. Okay, so I think you've done extensively. You've you've covered ethics, right? Eth ethics in research. So why do you think it's really it was really imperative for researchers to um, abbreviate HM's 
his name as HM, Henry Mulassen, his name as HM, when they were conducting a study on him. Any clue? Say it was to protect his personality. Okay. Okay. You are right. In research, we call something known as um, um, anonymity and confidentiality, which as a researcher, you are supposed to hold it in high regard, anonymity. Anonymity comes from the word anonymous. It means you're supposed to keep the person's what identity private. You should keep it out of what, out of the research work. And HM went through some series of things that led to some brain damage. So since scientists wanted to study him, they realized that, okay, it is imperative for us to for us to keep his name out of our publications or books or discussions to the public so that a lot of people wouldn't point, pinpoint and know, oh, so the HM, HM that we are referring to is this person and what have you. So let's, let me walk you through um, HM Sam's case, what happened. So HM was what, was a normal person. And interestingly, he was suffering from seizures, seizures, S-E-I-Z-U-R-S, -E seizures. And back in, back in the 90s, when someone is experiencing seizures, what they normally do is that they would do surgical operations by taking out some portions of the brain structures whereby um, these seizures normally happen. So one thing about seizures are that usually for a seizure to happen, it means that you have a lot of electrical firings happening in the brain in some portions of the brain leading to the seizures. So um, these scientists, or oh, yes, um, physicians, after scans of everything, they realize that when it comes to HM, his seizures normally happen at a temporal loop. So you can just type tem temporal loop. It's the brain which is close to the ears, your two ears is referred to as the temporal loop. So it means there are a lot of electrical firings happening at the right and left temporal loop of HM. So out of this, um, these clinicians did a surgery on HM, took out some portions of the temporal loop where these firings happens. So this is the area they took this area, yeah, these were the areas they took. Mm -hmm. So after they did a surgery on HM, they realized that um, his certain behaviors he was exhibiting was what was different, meaning that he was having memory loss. And out of it, they got to know that, oh, HM had both retrograde and anterograde amnesia. And interestingly, his anterograde amnesia was more profound. It was more severe. It means that he had complete anterograde amnesia. And currently, you know what ant ant anterograde amnesia is all about. It means he had difficulties forming new memories. So for instance, this popular psychologist that I've forgotten his name, he worked this series of um, works on what, on HM. And if I remember, he was, um, 
from Washington, Washington University, if I really recall that. Yeah. And day in and day out, HM will go to what will go to this professor who is at Washington University. So that certain test will be what will be done on him. Anytime HM goes to see this professor, he might perceive the prof professor as what? As a new person altogether, a new person he, he, he has just met. So let's say today I'm the professor, HM just comes to come to my office for the first time. I introduce myself, oh, I am Professor Susan and so I'm Kenneth Oswansa, and I'm here to conduct study on you. How are you doing? Then afterwards, I conduct uh, my study on you. The following week, you come. HM will perceive me as someone he has never met before. HM will ask, who are you? Then I need to introduce myself again. Oh, I'm Professor Susan, so I'm here to conduct a study on. So every session that HM goes to see a professor, he perceives this professor as what? As someone he has never met before, irrespective of within that day, all forms of pleasantries and jokes, everything that they will share. HM wouldn't be able to recollect any of them, anything. So it's more or less like he every every day is what is a new day altogether for what for HM. That's how until great amnesia works. Then with HM situation, he he had a partial retrograde amnesia. Why are we saying he had a partial retrograde amnesia? It's not like he completely forgot past um, information that he has taught. But um, after the um, surgery, he was having difficulties um, recalling, um, recollecting information that happened, if I remember, before he was a teenager. When, before he, said he was a teenager, he was having difficulties recollecting them in that regard. So these were some of the things he was experiencing out of it. So out of it, we said, oh, he has both retrograde and anterograde amnesia. Okay. So that's all when it comes to amnesia and HM Sam situation. And that's him. The picture here is um, HM. That's him. Okay. So the next, the next means in which one can also forget memory is um, what we normally call decay theory. Decay theory. So I'm reading, the memories fade with time. Very old memories are difficult to remember without periodic rehearsal. So as the, the name in itself implies, decay. So it means that some memories, when we don't really use it over time, it decays or we lose the information. So I'm repeating, some memories, when we don't really utilize it in our everyday life or use it in our daily lives. With time, those memories fade, it decays because it, it, it is something at the moment we don't really want to rely on it. So it decays. So I've given you two main practical examples. Like, let's say, currently, you have no child or toddler or whatsoever in your house, whereby you'll be exposed to certain poems and rhymes that they recite. Then I ask you to, oh, recollect some of the poems back in kindergarten or nursery. You used to what you used to recite 
some of them, you will see that you will strain hard to recite it fluently. Especially if you don't have any child, or yes, who is in the house that normally recite these things, or, or yes, these things in the house. It becomes something difficult for you to also what um, keep track and re and recollect it fully or fluently. Why? Because at that point in time, you don't really use these rhymes for anything. In your adulthood life, you don't really use these rhymes or poems that you've learned. So there's no connection between the rhymes you learned like um, 20 years or 15 years ago and currently your status. That's how it is. Again, the National Pledge. If I ask you at the moment to recite the National Pledge, majority of you becomes, it will become what, a problem for you to recite it from um, A to Z. Why? Because at the moment, you don't, you're not even exposed to the National Pledge often. You're not really exposed to it often. So it is something that you don't really use it. So hence, it fades. But back in primary school, whereby, oh, every morning during, um, during school assembly, you are taxed upon to work to recite the National Pledge. With that, it was something that was really what, easy for you to fluently say, say it. Why? Because at that point, when you are in school during that period, you were utilizing those memories because every morning you were taxed to what to recollect them. But the moment in your adulthood life, you don't really what use the national pledge to do anything. And even when watching TVs, at what occasion do we even recite the national pledge? None. So it becomes hard for you to recollect. Unlike the national anthem, whereby you are sometimes exposed to it. I think um, some few days ago, two days ago or so, when the Blasters were playing football, yeah, they were they recited the national pledge when Black Meteor um, and um, the maiden ladies or Black maidens or whatsoever, when they are playing, you'll be exposed to these things. Again, during C's match, you'll be exposed to the national anthem. So hence, in, in periodic occasions, you are, you are exposed to them. That makes you refresh your mind. So it wouldn't lead up to any decay. But if you are not exposed to it at all, then it means it will lead to what, a decay. So that's what um, decay theory basically is trying to tell us. <laughs> Okay. Then the next one is um, interference. Interference. We are saying that sometimes due to certain information that we've learned, that's old information and new information that we've learned, it could also impede us, uh, yes, as to recall uh, an information. So when it happens like that, then we call it interference. So all the new information that we've learned, when we want to re recollect any of these things, the opposite ones could what could impede us from what, from remembering the other one. So um, with interference too, we have two types of interference. We have retroactive interference and proactive interference. So let's find out what retroactive interference is. So what we are saying is that with retroactive interference, it means new information, the current information that you've learned could inhibit or impede you from recalling an old information that you've, what you've learned. 
to get it, get it well with retroactive new information prevent the individual from recollecting past information. So an example that I used was um, someone who has difficulties re recalling um, his former girlfriend's name. So like, let's say this gentleman Kwame currently has a new girlfriend known as um, known as Abigail. And Kwame used to date Anita. Then he went to the mall. When he got to the mall, he saw his former girlfriend, that's his ex, Anita. Instead of, so the moment Kwame saw Anita, he, he wanted to call Anita. Then spontaneously, he just shouted, Abigail. So it means that his current girlfriend's name, which is Abigail, impeded him from, from recollecting and knowing that, oh, my ex name is what? It's Anita. So when it happens like that, then we call it retroactive interference. Retroactive interference. So the new information that Kwame has taught, which is his current girlfriend's name, prevented him from even recalling the exact name of his former, his former girlfriend, which is Anita. Okay. Then let's also find out what proactive interference is all about. And it will be the opposite of retroactive. So this time around, the old information that you earlier stored impedes your ability to, uh, to recollect new information that has currently been stored. So it means the old information is preventing you from recollecting new information. So a typical example is, I know Kumasi, the popular pizza joint here is Pizza Man. Let's say Pizza Man um, initially via business operation was at um, Kenyase around Garden City. And they used to have a contact number that, okay, usually you order food, the pizza or whatever food they sell there. So we had this um, number when they were at Kenya, so that's 024. They used to use this popular number, 024, when they were at Kenya. So then currently, They've moved to airport runabout. They've changed their contact. They've changed their contact to 054. So although you've stored the two numbers, but you have these numbers off head. So it's not like, okay, you need to go through contact and search. So normally whenever you want to call the current number, that's, is at um, airport runabout. Anytime you want to call that number, you will just what you just um, type the old number, which is 024, instead of typing the new number, which is 054. So hence, the old information that you've stored, the old contact that you've stored for Pisa Man is always impeding your ability to, uh, to recall or recollect that, oh, they have a new number, which is 054. All right, so when it happens, then we call it proactive interference. Okay, then, the, all right, I think, um, Anne. Sir, please, uh, 
the other slide, the one we we're just explaining. Can you can we use the the recalling of the former girlfriend's scenario to same explain the priority? Where yeah, if if it is realistic, yeah. Uh huh. Where instead of calling you by your name and he calls you by the former girlfriend because of certain instances that happened between them. Yeah, yeah. Then it becomes proactive interference. Okay. okay yeah. Sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Then the last one, which could also lead to some people forgetting or losing certain information they've stored, is skill dependent or context dependent forgetting. So we are saying a memory can't be retrieved because some missing stimulus, cue or context, which was probably used to encode a memory in the first place is missing. We are missing. So what we are saying is that with the cue dependent and context dependent forgetting, what they are saying is that when someone is encoding something, um, a, a new material, like, okay, when the person is learning a new material, the environment in which you find it, if um, there's a difference between the environment in which he was learning and the environment in which he has been taxed to record that information, then a person is likely to lose the information. So a, a typical example is, let's say during the time that I was learning, I learned in a classroom whereby, okay, the place was fully, um, there was a full air condition happening. Okay. When I was learning, that means I switch on the ACs and everything to, uh, to, have, to feel comfortable during that period. Then examination, during examination, I have been moved from the classroom setting to an examination hall whereby there's no AC, but rather they've just opened the windows to allow air to pass through. According to the Q dependent, there is um, a discordance or indifference between the time that you, are, you, you were learning and the time that, or the context that um, you are supposed to what, recall. So hence, the person is likely to, uh, to lose information or the person is likely to forget certain information. It means that the person wouldn't be able to re retrieve the information that he or she learned earlier. Because there's no consistency in the environment. Another example is, it's not only about the environment. Also, they also say that even always for one to be able to retrieve or recollect anything, the mood of the person should be consistent during the time that the person was encoding and the time that the person wants to retrieve the information. So again, per the context dependent forgetting, if during the time that you were learning, you were in a, in a happy mood, and the time that you are called upon to, uh, to retrieve, whereby you are in, a, in an examination hall, you are sad, then it means you are likely not to, uh, not to recollect those information. Why? Because there is disparity between your mood when you were learning and the mood when you are called upon to recollect or retrieve the information. So always for you to recollect anything, 
your mood should be what should be consistent. If you were sad during a time that you were learning, then it means that for you to really what recollect the information well, you should also what be sad at that moment. If you were happy during the time that you were learning, then it means during the time you are called upon to retrieve the information, you should be what happy. There should always be consistencies. So an example that I gave was, some people chew a particular flavor or gum, it's rather gum, not U.M. Another flavor, a particular flavor of gum or drink certain type of tea while studying. When taking an exam, covering that material, they will chew the same gum or drink the same tea to help jog their memory. So it means the only time that the person was studying, this is what the person was doing, chewing gum, a particular flavor of a gum or drink, then it means that for you to, uh, to um, recollect the, the material that you were learning, you are supposed to do the same thing. Chew the same gum or bring the same what? See. Why? Because when, do, when, when there's consistency between the time that you are encoded you were encoding and the time that you are called upon to recollect. It's what, it, con it helps you to what to connect and even have some um, abstract thoughts about the incident that happened. All right, Yasewa. Okay, so good morning. Good morning. Um, please, uh, it's this. Um, it's a contribution I want to make concerning okay. the cue dependence. I okay. remember watching a movie called um, Aquila and the Bee. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. So yeah. in this movie, whilst the lady was spelling, spelling, she was skipping. So during the main contest, you see her skipping and exactly. spelling those same words. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. That's a typical example. Yes, I remember I also watched that movie. And you could see that um, during the time that um, Akila was learning these what these um, words and everything, um, her supervisor would what would instruct her to skip. So at one point, when she was called upon to what to um, to spell a particular word. In order to jog her memory, you realize she was what well, she was um, trying to also skip and uh, simultaneously what spelling the do uh, the words as a means to help her jog her memory in that regard. All right, so that'll be all when it comes to memory. When it comes to memory, please. Any question? Okay, Madam Margaret. Please go ahead. Please unmute your mic. You've still muted yourself. Okay, Madam Margaret, you can test rather. Okay. All right. So I'm moving on. You can test then later on. I would what I would um read and give you the appropriate response. So moving on, um, the next the next topic that we um, we'll be doing is um, health, stress, and coping. Health, stress, and coping. So this basically is within the realms of um, health psychology, and I think you already know the role of a health psychologist. So it means they normally use psychological and behavioral principles to prevent 
certain illnesses as a means to promote individuals' well-being or, or health. So that's one, the major role of a health psychologist. They use psychological principles as a means to, uh, to um, promote well-being and health or prevent um, persistent physical diseases. Yeah. So um, in most disorders, physical disorders, stress is something that plays an integral role for there to be an onset of what of such um, disorders. Stress is considered to be one of the key things that could work, that, that could always make um, these chronic um, diseases be, be what be persistent in the person's what life. So health psychologists try to what try to find out the various stresses the person is going through and how best they can reduce those um, stresses using psychological um, techniques in that regard. So as I've earlier opined, you can see I've indicated health psychologists, they get people to increase behaviors that promote health, such as good diet, regular exercise, then quitting, um, alcohol, smoking, and what have you. Especially when it comes to substance use, it's something that they play an important role. They try to help people manage substance use in that regard. Why? Because research helps us to understand that taking in most of these substances to a large extent um, destroys your immune system. And sometimes people have become addicted to it. It's difficult for them to stop. So hence, that'll be the time health psychologists and even clinical psychologists come in to help them manage such uh, things they are suffering from. So as I said, it, it all boils down to stress, stress. And as you already know of what of stress. Um, and I think um, there's no need for me to, for me to um, talk about the definition of stress. But the key thing is that when people find themselves in what in um, a stressful situations, they react to it in that um, their autonomic nervous system becomes active. And currently when I say autonomic nervous system, you all know the autonomic nervous system when we're doing biological psychology. Remember I said within the autonomic nervous system, we have two types, the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So it means when someone finds himself in stressful situations, the sympathetic nervous system, which is found, which is within the autonomic nervous system becomes really active, making a person what um, go through certain physiological um, reactions. So let's find out what are some of the key uh, stresses people usually um, go, through, go through in that regard. And I think I've already defined um, what? Let me, sorry. Let me mute all of you. Okay. So we are saying a stressor is a condition or event that challenges or threatens a person. So for someone to go through any stressful situation, it has to do with certain incidents or events that happen to the person. And that event is what is referred to as stressor. The event that led to the stress is what is normally referred to as stressor. So for instance, 
we have several stresses like one is daily stress so it's when someone is at the workplace and the person feels that oh i feel overwhelmed or the pressure at the workplace is too much i'm bombarded with a lot of responsibilities my supervisor is really draining me then that becomes what a stressor or in school the person think oh I am overwhelmed with what with um school acti activities. It looks like I need to always every week throughout the week I need what I need to um go for lectures, do assignment. These lectures are what are bombarding us a lot with a lot of what academic staff. That's how the person feels. Then it becomes what a stressor. Or even in the house, maybe the person feels that oh my spouse is stressing me out giving me a lot of responsibilities to do, plus taking care of the case, blah, 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 my family, need to take care of my family, what have you. It all boils down to a stressor. So they are part of the daily stress people usually experience. Sometimes to a sudden change in a person's um, life could serve as a stressor like all of a sudden the person losing his or her job that event is a sudden change the person never anticipated so it becomes what a stressor or the person um someone who just suddenly broke up with um the spouse without any what any alert or whatsoever it becomes what a serious stressor onto the person because the person never anticipated that okay this would happen like being in a divorce and all that or the person suddenly being communicated that oh you have this particular type of what of illness it is the person feels it is a sudden change in his or her health so it becomes what a stressor then apart from this, we can also have traumatic experiences, which could also become a stressor, like the person being abused. If um, someone has been sexually abused or physically abused, that event the person went through becomes a serious stressor in the person's life. Or um, going through major accidents like okay experiencing wars and these soldiers normally goes through these things a lot it becomes a serious stressor after the war and everything always their minds were tuned back to the stuff that they did during the war or and i think all of you heard of um a PRT inst the incident i think last year PRT incidents and book also what really happened it is a major accident so major accident of that sort becomes also a stressor on individuals who were exposed to it the inhabitants who were exposed to it or, or saw what happened it becomes a serious stressor in their lives so these are some of the ways and means in which stress could what could spring up So there's this popular person who developed um, a model to explain how stress springs up and the various um, cause or the various phases people go through in terms of stress. And his name is Hans Sale. So he developed this model known as the general adaptation syndrome general adaptation syndrome so according to um hans in terms of stress we go through several phases we go through three main what phases for you to respond to stress it all has to do with three phases so first of all he talked about the fact that um, the person will be in an alarming reaction when exposed to a stressor. 
like say um, the person suddenly lost his or her job then all of a sudden it becomes a stress on the person whereby there will be an al alarming reaction whereby the sympathetic nervous system will be activated leading to the fight flight responses then with time those reactions move to another phase known as the resistance phase which we will delve more into it then the last stage is what is the exhaustion stage so it goes through stage one which is alarming reaction then resistance phase then the last phase is the exhaustion stage but one thing sale emphasizes is that when the, these individuals go through these phases all the three phases day in and day out the person is exposed to the three phases as day in and day out it could cause a long lasting negative what effect on the person it means that when day in and day out an individual is exposed to all the three phases it could weaken the person's immune system it could weaken the person's immune system leading to several um diseases coming to the person or the person experiencing several diseases because of daily or chronic stress the person is exposed to so let's go through the main phases what they are and what really goes into it so as i said the first stage is the alarming stage so that's the first stage when someone is exposed to a stressor so let's say the person sorry today let's say the person was exposed to um an earthquake within some few minutes or so after the earthquake incident a day afterwards you will see the person's what reaction is or even some few hours after the earthquake you will see such individual going through all sorts of what of panics because at that period the sympathetic nervous system is highly active it's highly active releasing certain what certain hormones releasing certain hormones so what happens is that the sympathetic nervous system since it is active it will stimulate the adrenal glands and i believe you're all doing anatomy you know where the ad adrenal glands can be found where can we find the adrenal glands any clue and please where can the adrenal glands be found oh oh you have not been taught yet when it comes to anatomy okay so you can find it at the top of what of the kidney so let's say this is the kidney on top of the kidney we have the adrenal glands on top of the kidney we have the adrenal glands so usually um when the sympathetic nervous system is active like that it will then what it will then go in there and, and stimulate this adrenal glands so that the adrenal glands will release some hormones known as cortisol and adrenaline adrenaline certain books will say um, epinephrine is the same thing it would release adrenaline and no adrenaline or epinephrine and no epinephrine so these are the hormones the adrenal glands would what will release cortisol adrenaline and no adrenaline so the moment these um, hormones are released then you would have these physiological reactions like you see your heart beating fast faster which is the palpitation 
then you see that, okay, you'll be able to be panting. Your breathing rate also increases. Also be panting. Then um, your blood pressure would also want to rise. All these physiological reactions that you go through is due to the release of cortisol, adrenaline, and noradrenaline in your system. In your system. Okay. So, um, as a, during the alarming stage, these are some of the physical signs that happens because of the release of um, cortisol and adrenaline and all that. And you are in the fight flight responses. You can see like any um, activation of the sympathetic nervous system, the pupil, which is the black eye, will dilate. Then as I said, your heart will be beating faster, which is the same as we say in palpitation, you experiencing palpitation. You have rapid breathing, you'll be panting. Then others will be what to be shaking or trembling. Then others will have this flash of pale skin. Then heighten our senses. It's more or less like you are hyperventilating and, and all that. So these are the main physical signs such individuals was experiences so when nothing is done to the um alarming stage definitely it still persists and lead on to the resistance stage so with the resistance stage we have two key things if so let's let's find out what the resistance stage is all about we are saying it is when the body tries to repair itself after initial shock of stress. So after the alarming stage, what happens is that with the resistance stage, sometimes the body tries to what tries to come back to its normal self. That means the parasympathetic nervous system will be activated to let the person come, sorry to let yeah the person come to his or her normal self, whereby the pupil that were dilating would what would constrict then your heart beating faster will slow down but for that to happen for um those reactions you earlier experienced at the alarming stage to happen then it means that you might perceive you should perceive that the stressor is no longer present so when the thing that caused the stress you perceive it as, oh, it is something which is no longer existing in my life. Then all of a sudden you will see that, okay, those reactions what reduces. But in a situation whereby the person who experienced the stress and it led to an alarming stage, always perceive that, oh, this stressor still exists in my life. I might, I, I'm likely to what I'm likely to face the same what the same situation like okay, those in a PT or book or so, whereby um, these things happen. And I think you all know what really happened at especially book or so. If the, these individuals or inhabitants still think, oh, we need to be cautious, and yes, uh, the same thing would what would happen. That means, hey, um, they are hyper vigilant, always thinking that a hey, by one or two reasons, ABCD will happen. This thing is bound to happen. Or they always have flashbacks about the incident. Then it means that the thing is still what persistent. They feel the thing is still persistent. Then hence, you will see that always they are what they are reactions physiologically. They still go through the physiological reactions whereby they have to be beating faster. They, they have these choking sensations. Always they are heightened. Always they, are, they have rapid breathing because day in and day out, they believe 
these things still persist. The stressor they went through still persists. Then it means they are still in the resistance or stage. So since they believe that, okay, the stressor still per persists, what happens is that day in and day out, the stress hormones, which is the cortisol, adrenaline, and no adrenaline, will keep on being secreted by the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands will keep on secreting these what? These hormones. So as to make the person go through these physiological reactions and physical reactions. Okay. So one thing about this is that prolonged levels of um, these resistance stage, as I've indicated, could weaken the immune system. Not only the immune system, even your digestive tract would also be weakened. Your heart and the reproductive systems would also what, be weakened in that regard. So during the resistance stage, whereby always the person is always hypervigilant, thinking that a hey, the same stress I might be exposed to the same stressor, what have you. These are some of the symptoms they experience. They have bowelly issues because, as we rightly said, they have disturbances in their digestive tract. So they have bowel issues, always having headaches. They have difficulty sleeping, always feeling frustrated and sad. And the little thing, they become angry. And since always your attention is on finding things in your environment to see if the same incident wouldn't happen, you, you have poor concentration. Your concentration is always on, the, on your stressor. So other daily activities you are supposed to do, you don't really do it. So hence, you have poor concentration. When these things keeps on persisting, then it will lead to exhaustion stage. So when a resistance stage keeps on persisting in the person's life, always hypervigilant, thinking about um, his or her stressor, then it becomes a chronic stress. It becomes a, a prolonged stress leading to the third stage. And during the third stage, it's more or less like um, the person is physically, emotionally, and mentally drained to the extent that the person can no longer cope with even the stress. So the person feels, okay, I'm helpless because it has become a prolonged um, stress in the person's life. So definitely he feels, okay, he or she feels, I can't do anything about what, about the stress and just gives in. And that'll be the time, a whole lot of what, a whole lot of um, emotional, behavioral and physical reactions or exhaustions comes in. So under the emotional signs, you could see, okay, the person is always mentally drained. Well, yeah, Juma Crown Power said, the, the concentration is not there. And the person feel that, okay, I can't even think, I can't think well. And it gets to a stage whereby right now they become indifferent about anything. They don't care about even their work responsibilities. They come to work at any time that they want. They don't really, they are not punctual to work because of apathy. Then a little thing too, they become what's angry. They are very irritable because of the fact that the stresses they were earlier exposed to has made things draining for them. Always thinking about the stresses. And at the workplace, if care is not taken, when it's, it, it gets to the exhaust, exhaustion stage, it is highly possible that there'll be burnout. There'll be burnout. So if the person is a nurse, it means that always, it's like the person is not of her normal self. Always distance herself from what from the work. Always want to be alone, even when she comes to the workplace. Like it's like she has lose energy and drive to even work. And always finding negative things to say about the work. Responsibilities or staffs giving to her to do him or her to do. 
Why? Because they be our bread. Let me put it in our fashion. Every day, the person is tired. And the person is drained out. Not because of the work itself, but because of um, the stresses she was, he or she was earlier exposed to. So hence, he or she feels, okay, I'm helpless. I can't do anything about it. So day, day in and day out, this stress keeps on what? Coming to her, making the person feel, I can't do anything. I can't even work. When the person comes to work, we see the person what? Lying down, sleeping, doesn't care about what about his or her responsibilities. That's how burnout works. Then the fiscal signs are that okay. Always the person will have will be bombarded with what with um, several ailments. Always the person would what would experience headaches, complaining about okay, I'm suffering from this disease. What have you? Because when you get to the exhaustion stage, your immune system is highly weakened. So any little um, infections or pathogens that um, surrounds your body, you, you what? It makes you fall sick because your immune system can't really fight these what? These um, pathogens, bacteria, and what have you. So hence, you're more likely to use medications Often and sometimes even some of these medications, the person becomes um, tolerant to it. As such, the person needs to uh, take higher dosage, dosage levels of those medications. All right. So please, any question when it comes to the exhaustion stage? Any question? All right. So let me use this example so that you appreciate how the um, general adaptation syndrome really happens. So let's say there's this person who wanted to write an exams, okay? So during examination, let's say during revision week, get into Revision week, whereby there's um, anxieties and stress and everything. Let's find out how these processes could what could fit in. So the first stage is alarming reaction, whereby we are saying you have trembling hands and butterflies in your stomach prior to the start of an important exams. So during examination period, definitely there's some sort of stress. Leading to what? Leading to your even your hands shaking. Then your, of course, we have to show that the butterflies in your stomach. I'm talking. I'm referring to. And all that. Because you feel okay. This examination is what is really important to me. That's my last what my last um paper, in the university or what have you. So at that period, the physiological reactions you are going through is the alarming what reaction. If care is not taken, it could lead to what resistance, whereby you have finished your exams, all right, but you're also having troubles switching gears just to focus on other things. So definitely, yes, you wrote the exams. You are done writing the exams, but still you have difficulties concentrating. It could be that, okay, when you wrote the exams, you think, oh, I couldn't really write it well, like the way I was expecting it. So day in and day out, every day, you keep on what? Focusing on the negative things or the incorrect um, things you feel, you feel you didn't do what you didn't do in the exams. Then it becomes what? A resistance stage because you have difficulties switching your attention from, to other things and focus on them. Your mind is still on the exams, thinking that you didn't do anything, you didn't do certain things well. Then what do you think will happen to you? You will become stressed out because you are still releasing these stress hormones, making you anxious, making you at um, G3 and what have you. When these things persist, 
for a while, then it becomes chronic stress. So even after your grade comes, you are still what you are still pondering over what, over. Oh, let me mute you all. You are still pondering over what over um what really happened. You are still pondering over it. Okay. So you are having, as I said, with the exhaustion stage. Um, Madam Irene, can you um switch off your video, please? Madam Irene, Lebena, sorry. So your video is in the past, but you still feel um anxious and um depressed. Okay. So that's what happened. You've already written your what your exams and everything, but still you feel what you feel anxious in that regard. So then in the out, you could see that okay, you have troubles sleeping and what have you, and still thinking about other what other issues, your your your, your what your exams. Even when there's an incoming exams, what happens to you? You become stressed out, anxious, thinking about the past exams that you did which you think, oh, it didn't go well. So you think, oh, the same thing will happen to you. Yeah, so that's how this model happens. All right, Madam Anne. Say, please, I'm in the resistance stage right now because Okay. Our Miss Master exam for your course. You have been released. Really so even if I sleep cry, you know. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, um, it will be released. So please soon. help us so that we don't reach the last stage, the, the exhaustion stage. <laughs> okay, it will be released really soon. The thing is, this time around, all the exams has other lecturers re released their exams. Yes, we have pharmacology results. Okay, so they just forwarded it to you via um, is it um, in in um, an Excel format or something? Uh, it's it's like a compiled list for our centers with our index numbers. So you okay. just look for index number and look at your mass. Okay, so I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll do that soon. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks for the reminder. Okay. So any other thing, any other question or whatsoever? Okay. Then let me um continue. And I think these are the physiological reactions. I think I've already what, talked about um, these things. So I, during a spare time, you can watch, you can read about um, them. So the next one is how does stress affect your health? And I think even when explaining, I've already also commented on these things. So especially when, you, when a person still gets to the exhaustion stage, Okay, then it becomes a severe thing. Hence, your immune system is what is weakened. And since your immune system is weakened, then it means that you are open to what to all forms of what of um, diseases because the immune system then needs to fight some of these um, pathogens or bacteria. They are what they are very very weak. So any infection, any infection, that you get, any infection that you get, it creates a toll on you. So that's what normally happens. It creates a toll on the person. And as I said, chronic job stress could lead to what burnout. And we've already explained what um, it basically means. All right, so let's find out how um, these stresses can be what can be um, managed. So in most situations, um, it's not always about medications that are normally given to what to people to what to reduce their stress unless maybe um the stress level has led to serious anxiety that'll be the time 
medications that's anti anxiety or anxiolytics will be what will be given. But in most situations, when it comes to stress, um, medications are not prescribed, but rather some management techniques you can use. Because in most situations, it has to do with your thoughts, your thinking patterns about the stressor, which is always fueling the stress and certain behaviors that you've adopted, which is fueling them. So we have to what we have to change your thinking patterns and some of your behavioral patterns so that um, things will come back to normal. So, so sometimes um, when people are stressed out, they are even giving some, um, they are told to, uh, to be on certain um, food regimens, that's certain nutritional um, things. Like they are told to, oh, taking fish a lot and what have you, chocolate, dark chocolate and what have you. Why? Because enough studies point out that when you're taking these um, foods, it reduces the stress hormones. It reduces the production of these stress hormones. That's the essence of you taking these, what, these um, foods especially dark chocolate, is considered to, uh, to reduce stress hormones significantly. Then also, um, some people, when they are stressed out, you know, physiologically, it's like, okay, your heart is beating faster. Um, you, you are shaking or trembling and all that. So you have poor control physiologically. So you doing regular exercise, normal exercise, also helps to what helps to calm your body down it helps to calm your body down that's what it happens okay and one key thing most um clinicians or psychologists normally do is, um, you know, remember I said, when you find yourself in stressful situations, it's more or less like, okay, your body, you're having difficulties with controlling your body physiologically because you are trembling, you are shaking, your heart is beating faster, you have difficulties controlling. So in most situations, these techniques are used. I just expose you to these things, but you can just read about them yourself it is normally used in clinical settings to help patients relax. Because as I said, at that point in time, they have the causes controlling their bodies. So when they do these things, it relaxes them and it relaxes their body so that um, whatever stress they are going through will be what will be reduced. So you can just even go to YouTube and key in progressive muscle relaxation. It is something that we do of often in clinical settings to reduce stress, not only stress, but also anxiety. Again, autogenic relaxation is also used. These are all relaxation techniques. Then we have another relaxation technique known as diaphragmatic breathing exercises. Yeah, then we also have meditation, which I normally use. I don't want to um, bore you with what really goes into it, but during your spare time for reading sake, you can just even key in these things. When you, when you go to YouTube, just key any of these things and videos will, what will pop up showing you how it is done in that regard, how it is done. So these relaxation exercises, to the largest thing, changes a person's behavioral what um, patterns. But what of the person's thinking patterns? Because when people are stressed out, sometimes it it has to do with their negative thinking patterns about 
the incident that really what happened. So the example that I use whereby the person was experiencing examination anxiety, it is normal for you to experience examination anxiety. But when it gets to the resistance stage, whereby after writing the exams, the person feels, oh, this exam, I didn't really write it well. Um, it's like, I am what? I am inadequate. I'm worthless. These are some of the thinking patterns that comes to the person's mind. Thinking that, oh, me not writing this well, then it means it is a total what F. Maybe the person, it could be that, okay, the person wrote, was able to write about 60 or 70% of it in a perfect manner. Then the other 30, he or she couldn't what, really write it like the way he or she wanted. Then all of a sudden, the person concludes that, oh, then I failed. So always brooding about the fact that, hey, I've already, I'm already a failure. I'm a failure. I'm a failure. Think keeps on making you what? Stress out. Keeps on making you stress out. That perception that you have keeps on making you stress out. So the key thing is that most clinicians, especially therapists or psychologists, helps you to tweak your mind, switch your mind from what, from thinking about them of that sort, making, making you think that hey, you are, you are a failure, you are a failure, it's bad. So you are guided to what, to um, switch your mind from thinking in that manner into what, into a positive light. And the technique which is normally used is what is referred to as cognitive restructuring. So normally cognitive restructuring is helped to change the person's negative thoughts into positive thoughts. That's the essence of cognitive restructuring. It goes in there to change the person's negative mindset about an event into a positive one, into a positive one. All right. So um, this is just further explaining um, the various appraisals. When I say appraisal, it has to do with your evaluations about your thinking patterns that um, you sometimes do. All right. And apart from that, apart from that, um, we also find out that certain um, psychodynamic psychologists, for instance, have been able to also help us to understand that certain um, defense mechanisms that we do, certain defense mechanisms that we do, could also help reduce anxiety. So um, I don't know whether you've done introduction to psychology before and all that, but one thing you should know is that um, we have this person known as Freud. Sigmund Freud, he's the one who propounded this theory, psychodynamic theory. I didn't really emphasize on it because um, it was not all that necessary in, in terms of your, 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 yours. So it is not part of your syllabus. But he emphasized that sometimes some individuals use certain or certain defense mechanisms as a means to reduce certain stress or anxieties they go through. So in terms of the defense mechanisms, he has indicated several of them. These are the various types of defense mechanisms. He or he opined. So I would expose you to some of them. So let's go through some of the various types of defense mechanisms that um, he emphasized. So the first one is um, repression, repression, repression. So under repression, 
it means that um, certain individuals when they encounter when they encounter some um, hurtful or disturbing events, their mind, their mind consciously, their that's the mind consciously what pushes those memories out of the person's what consciousness. So I'm repeating it again. With repression, what happens is that when certain individuals encounter um, a threatening event or situation, their mind pushes those events out of the person's conscious. So the, the, the mind pushes the event into the person's unconscious mind. And when information gets to the unconscious mind, it means the person wouldn't be able to recall them. A typical example is someone who has been sexually assaulted, who has been sexually assaulted. Some of these victims, after the incident, when they come for sessions and you ask them to, oh, recollect vividly, the incidents that transpired in the assault. Some of them can't really give you full details. It's not like, okay, they are lying to you or they are hiding information from you. They will strain hard trying to what, recollect exactly the exact details that happened. Sometimes they wouldn't be able to recollect some of them. It's more or less like a blackout. They have a blackout. They can't really recollect some of the details of the event. When it happens like that, then we call it repression. It means that the mind foresaw the incident the person was exposed to as something that is really, really what? Threatening to the person. So the mind pushed some of these detailed information out of the person's memory or consciousness. That's repression. Another defense mechanism that we do to reduce certain stress we go through is denial. With this, the person intentionally what? Intentionally decide to um, push it away from his or her awareness. So this time, it's not the mind that is pushing. But this time, the person knows that, okay, this, thing, this incident really happens. It happened, but denies the fact that, oh, and see that it never happened. So the person intentionally what? Push it out of awareness. A typical example is someone who is grieving, lost um, someone who was very, very dear to him or her. At that point in time, that person is in a, in a typical what, denial stage because the person wants to what wants wants to um, calm him or herself down, so they think they feel that okay, it never happened. Nope, this person is not really is not dead. I'm I'm really really was certain that this person is not what is not dead. Let me give you one incident that happened to me when I was doing my practicum some years back at um, Lekma Hospital, which is located at Accra. So when I was in my practicum, there was one time a nurse came to the consulting room and told me that, oh, there's this um, patient who is currently what, refusing to um, let them take the child to the mock. So they wanted me to, uh, to come over and what, and convince her to what uh, to. Um, let them take the child in the mock and everything. And interestingly, um, this woman is a, is a serious, she has this strong um, religious what, faith and everything. So what really transpired was that, according to the woman, her son was um, ill. I think the child was around seven years or so. Five to seven years, yeah, was sick has been sick for a while, I think malaria or so, for about weeks. 
and he was just using her herbal medications and everything on the child and the situation worsened so he he she rushed the child to um immediate an immediate hospital they tried finding the veins of the child they couldn't find so that was when they referred the mother to come to lekma hospital so it, it seems um the moment they, they go to the the hospital the child was already what dead so um the physicians couldn't do anything and that was when they wanted to take the child to the morgue and everything but she was bent on the fact that she believes the child is not really what dead she was still bent on it knowing that okay i have this person this spiritual father that i believe that okay he can what he can um make the child um breath come back so from her perspective the child is still what is still alive and something can be done so that's a typical what denial stage in that regard when all claims has been given that hey this is the reality the person still perceives that nope other people too um they do something known as um projections so they have this unwanted thoughts or feelings they've been having and they know that it is unacceptable for them to have those thoughts then they will then transfer that thought to another person and say oh this person is the one who have this sort of thoughts so a typical example is let's say um two people are in a serious relationship then the lady have this unwanted thought or feelings of cheating on the partner instead of it's not like okay the person has committed the act by cheating but have this thought of what of cheating on the partner instead of accepting the fact that i'm the one having this thinking patterns or feelings she would then what transfer it onto the other partner and say oh the male partner is the one who really wants to cheat on me why is she doing that she's doing that as a means to what as a means to reduce the stress that she's going through in terms of having these unwanted feelings or thoughts so these are some of the ways and means in which we what we do these things another one is displacement displacement so with displacement we sometimes um transfer whatever um bad things we um some a high authority did to us onto a lower substitute we usually transfer whatever um behaviors and a high authority did to us to a lower substitute so a typical example is there's this mill boss there was this mill employee at the workplace always his boss what insult him okay and make him feel bad at the workplace and this person is really really angry at the boss but instead of confronting the boss the man will wait till he gets home then what do you think we'll do we'll transfer whatever anger and everything that he had onto which people maybe the partner or children the children or inanimate what objects around by hitting the sink hitting certain things as a way to feel what good or reduce the stress that his boss um, made him go through at the workplace. Okay, so basically, I think um, the time is up. So basically, these are some of the um, defense mechanisms people normally use in that regard. So please, any question or clarification concerning um, this? Okay, Madam Christiana. 
Sir, please, I wanted to know uh, with the defense mechanisms, I realized that uh, most of us use this defense mechanism yeah. in our daily lives. We, we often use them. Yeah. Each one of us can testify to the fact that we've used one or two or yeah. even more than that. So I wanted to know, can the long use of this def defense mechanism, can't it have a ripping effect on an individual? Let's say an individual abuses it or uses it for a very long time. Can't it have an effect on the person? Not necessarily the person, but people around the individual. So for instance, if you are doing displacement, to you, you using the displacement suit whatever stress or reduces whatever stress you you what you went through. But the repercussions of your attitude is that it would what it would cause soil in your relationship, right? Like okay, the the, um, the man example that I use, whereby your boss what frustrated you all right. You came to the work, you came to home. What did you do? You pent up your anger towards what towards your what your partner, which is an intimate partner violence, right? So that's a typical displacement. Although it it is soothing the perpetrator by reducing the person's what anxiety, but it is causing another what another um, negative effect on people around mm -hmm. that person, which is bad. So yes, it could have negative ripping effects. Okay, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, so please, any other question? Any other question? Okay, so if there are no questions. Hello, sir. Okay, Madam. Please. Jeanette. Um, last week, you didn't send us the recording. And yeah, um, so can you please do us a favor and then send? Kindly go to YouTube. I have uploaded it on YouTube. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And please also don't forget to subscribe. Okay. Okay. Uh, I tell P32. Your hand is up. Please unmute your, your mic and speak. I tell. Please unmute your mic. Okay, so I'm thinking it's by mistake. So um I'm saying there. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I couldn't get the projection, the explanation very well. Uh so I don't know where I can pick it up. Okay. Me. So I'm saying with a projection, okay. The individual has an unwanted or unacceptable thoughts or feelings. Okay. So instead okay. of the person accepting the fact that oh, this is the unwanted thought or feelings I have. He would then transfer, that's project, transfer those okay. thoughts and say, oh, this person is the one having that thought, not me. Okay. So a typical example is the scenario whereby I said, oh, there's this female who has an unwanted thought to cheat on what? On the partner. It's not like, okay, the, the female has committed the act, but has this okay. thought or feelings of cheating on the partner. Instead of accepting that, okay, this is the thinking patterns I'm having, she would then what? She would then transfer it and say, oh, my partner is the one. I have a feeling that my partner is the one who are cheating on me. I think my partner is, is cheating. Okay, okay. okay. That's, that's, that's projection. All right, all right. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay. So if there are no other questions, then that will be the end of um, today's discussion. So... Take care of yourself, you all, and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Uh, Madam Jocelyn, you just <laughs> raise up your hand. Can I be, be snappy about it? Huh? Madam Jocelyn, you just... <laughs> Madam Jocelyn, please unmute um, your mic and speak. All right, so I think it's by mistake, so bye.